my background is that I represented John Lind um, and have uh, read a lot about history and, and the line, which is what we're talking about, the line between war and, and law. That's really what we're talking about. And the U.S. Constitution and its preservation and whether if to be suspended in some way in time of war, how so and to what extent and will we get it back? The, the Patriot Act uh, was enacted very shortly after 9-11 at a time when the political will, I think, of the American people was that something had to be done. And it was the nature of the attack that fueled uh, the, the Senate, the House, and who passed it uh, as they did. Um, and in that political context, the executive uh, first editorial comment, ran around to see what old list they had of things they'd always wanted but never been able to get. <laughs> and uh, produced that list for Congress and said, here, pass this and we'll be able to say we're doing something. Um, that's basically what happened. In that Patriot Act, among other things, it provides that the government may surreptitiously listen into and record conversations between lawyers and their clients. It provides for a roving wiretap, which uh, I'd like to explain uh, to you in this sense, because you may have been overheard on a telephone and not be aware of it. I say that rhetorically. I don't have any evidence that it's happened, but it certainly could happen, because traditional wiretaps, starting with a case called Olmstead, uh, which Justice Holmes uh, had a dissent in uh, and had an opinion in, uh, authorize wiretaps if you go to a court and you show probable cause, that is, you've got a level of evidence and you say, here, these specified crimes, and it's only certain violent crimes are involved, uh, are such that we want to listen to the phone of the target person. And here's the evidence we have against the target person. So if they have a phone in their office or they have a phone in their home, then you have an authorized wiretap search warrant and you can go and do that. And that's how the mafia always gets on these wiretaps. And they're, they're not very good at avoiding that. Uh, and, and, they, and they make it worse by thinking that they're going to disguise what they're saying. So they say things like, you know, we ought to, you know, him. You know what I mean? And then, you know, two later, two days later, Louis dies, you know. So, so in the trial, they introduce it. It's pretty good evidence against the defendants. Well, all right. A lot of people don't like those wiretaps. Uh, and, and there's a lot of abuse of them. I, in my practice, I have listened to the, the records, uh, listened to a receptionist who was talking to her boyfriend about what they did the night before when one of them is married. And I have heard, I've sat and I've listened to that because they were produced to me as a criminal defense lawyer. So wiretaps are not great. A roving wiretap allows them to pick any phone that the defendant, the, the person they're talking about, might use, including public phones. So if you've picked up a phone and it happens to be somewhere, you can do it. That's the Patriot Act. They can have sneak and peek uh, introductions into uh, private premises which are protected by the Fourth Amendment. They can go in. They, these are referred to historically as black bag jobs. Uh, that's what the FBI called them. And uh, they were illegal. They are certainly unconstitutional. We still have basic rights. You have your home. You, have, you may have your area within your office, your, your desk, your area there, and that, that may be personal to you. And you have a constitutional right to not have uh, General Ashcroft or somebody he's directed uh, sneak into your house and look at materials to see whether you've got something that they don't like. Um, the potential for abuse in all this uh, is extensive. Uh, beyond the Patriot Act itself, and I hope we have time to discuss some of the, these things, I'll just mention, Peter, if I may, uh, a couple of the cases that are pending that you've heard about in the, in the papers. 
Uh, one is Mr. Hamdi, who was found in Afghanistan and is still in a cell uh, in the United States, but not, he's not been allowed to see a lawyer. He's been there for a year and a half, or see anybody else, see his family or see anybody. Uh, he's declared to be an unlawful combatant. He's not a U.S. citizen. Uh, that's number one. Number two, Mr. Massawi, about I'm sure who I'm sure you have read, is in the Virginia District Court. Massawi is not a, not a U.S. citizen. He's accused of being a terrorist, and they're giving him process, but they will not bring the witnesses from Guantanamo that might give favorable evidence to him. And so Judge Brinkema, the very able judge there, has declared they cannot go after the death penalty for him. Uh, Mr. Padilla presents the most important case that will, I think, get to the U.S. Supreme Court eventually. Mr. Padilla is a U.S. citizen, uh, supposedly a Chicago gang banger. In, in the criminal law, we call this a bad guy. And he gang bangs. We don't even dare think about what it might be that he does, but he's a terrible person. And he, uh, uh, we don't know this because we don't have any evidence, but uh, we're told by the Attorney General that in a, in a worldwide broadcast from Moscow, one of my favorite touches from the Attorney General, that this man is a bad guy. And they declared him to be an unlawful combatant. Um, and they uh, are holding him. And remember the small point, he's a US citizen. And he's not allowed to see a lawyer and he's not allowed to see family. If they establish that precedent without alarming anybody, because I hope we're gonna talk about certain issues in history uh, tonight that, that happened during war, these things happen during war. But if they establish that precedent, uh, if they declare anyone to be an unlawful combatant in a matter of national security, they can seize them and put them in a cell and nobody can see them. And they can hold them for the duration of something, whatever that might be. I think, I think I'll stop, I think I've hopefully <laughs> whetted your interest. We're gonna talk more about this. But uh, I, uh, Peter, I'll just say that, that uh, I do try to be objective about it. You've got Guantanamo. Uh, that's another area. You've got prisoners down there, mostly who were seized in Afghanistan, uh, mostly Taliban people, uh, Taliban and Al-Qaeda are different. We'll get into that a little bit. Uh, and they've been down there a year and a half. Uh, there have been over 30 suicide attempts in Guantanamo. It's a rights-free zone. Nobody can visit it. Nobody comes out. Nobody goes in. And the U.S. government is doing, is doing that in our name. Then, of course, there were the arrests following 9-11, uh, in which six, 700, 800 people were arrested and then have been released, or some have been charged, some have been deported. There's the problem of secret uh, immigration hearings that are closed. The Sixth Circuit, uh, one of the Federal appellate court says that's not right, you have to open them. The Third Circuit, Ju Judge Becker, uh, says no, you can have them closed. And in, I'll stop, I will stop with this, Peter, <laughs> I promise. Uh, it, judge Becker, who's a very good judge, but this is what happens to judges in time of war. He says you can close immigration hearings on the say-so of the Attorney General. Any hearing that the Attorney General wants to close, can you can do that because uh, we should at this time defer to the executive. And um, you, you can look forever in the U.S. Constitution. You will not find a provision about deference to the executive, especially in matters that have to do with sort of judicial review and courts and Im even immigration courts and that kind of thing. So. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Susan, uh, you're a librarian. There are some concerns for librarians in all of this, aren't there? Certainly. I think our situation may seem pale in comparison to some of the individual situations Mr. Brosnahan has mentioned, but in fact it represents, I think, the chilling effect that's going on in our country right now. Um, 
as we mentioned, the USA Patriot Act was passed immediately after 9-11, and I think everyone was very sensitive to homeland security. And whenever I personally talk about the Patriot Act, I like to reinforce that uh, the public library certainly supports uh, the value of personal and homeland security. And the Library Commission or the San Francisco um, City and County's position on the Patriot Act does not in any way uh, support their not wanting to have a safe environment. But the Patriot Act does have a chilling effect on you as library users. One of the hallmarks of library services, I think it's something that people really take for granted, is privacy of your records. We don't divulge to anyone when you get your library card, those records are completely confidential. Also the records of what you use at the library, the books you check out, the videotapes you borrow, the internet sites that you visit, that's all confidential. And our California state law is extremely clear on that and has a very high level of proof that they require before any of that material would be shared with anyone. Now the San Francisco Public Library of course responds to requests for borrower information and we've done so based on warrants by courts with lots of lots of in, lots of specific information about individuals. But what the USA Patriot Act does is it certainly lowers the threshold of information that anyone would have to put together, any uh, FBI or any local uh, law enforcement agency to gather information on individuals, which is what is the most chilling thing to us, I think, as library professionals. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about this as the program goes on, but we have not yet had a request of, uh, presented to us under the USA Patriot Act. If we had one presented, I would first confer with our city attorney, and I believe that I have to act legal and, legally and I would respond based on their advice. But the library and uh, the city of San Francisco have taken a strong stand against the elements of the USA Patriot Act that affect the information shared about borrowers, um, as well as uh, bookstores are under the same condition that they're required to give information about materials that individuals have, have purchased. So I think the key concern that I have is, is there's a very key balance here um, about protecting the privacy of our citizens. That's a very important element in our society. And would we jeopardize that for information about a very limited number of individuals? Some of you may know uh, or may have heard that imme immediately after September 11th incident, a librarian, a public librarian in a Florida public library recognized some of the individuals that were thought to be the perpetrators as having used the public internet terminals in this Florida branch library. What this individual did was she discussed with her library administration who later discussed with the local police and the FBI the information that that they had and they did in fact provide that information because it was of national importance to try to obtain information on these individuals. And I think that the um, opportunities for public use of the internet in public libraries are widespread. And I think that many members of the public, including possibly the terrorists, might think that their use of information at the public library could never be traced. Now again, I say we don't keep track of the internet records or internet sites or anything like that, but depending on how systems are configured, you can in some situations trace IP addresses or the sign-on of the individual to tell who has been using those internet sites. But that kind of information should only be used under the highest of levels of proof that that's required. So I think I, it puts librarians in a difficult dilemma. Uh, we want to support Homeland Security, but we also want to protect the user's rights. That's the hallmark of our trade. I think in a way, and we'll probably talk about this a little bit later, it's really put, in, put the spotlight on librarians. We're a good, strong profession, and we support wonderful beliefs, and now we have the Attorney General, Mr. Ashcroft, thinking that we're all a bunch of loonies. So, I mean, I think that's pretty good publicity <laughs> to get. 
when he talks against us on the Today Show, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> did he attack librarians? Oh, uh, yes. Did he? Yes, he did. <laughs> he What's <didn't>. next? <laughs> He did indeed. He found out librarians are not themselves silent, even though they may want other people to be inside there. Jim, you mentioned the whole thread of history. Uh, we look back at history and we see things like the Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, no. Lincoln suspending habeas corpus. Yeah, the, I, I, uh, what, tell us that we've been well, here before. You know, we, we really, we need a historian a professional on this panel. Uh, speaking for myself, I'm an amateur, but I ha I've read and I, I was fascinated by uh, the history of the line between war and law in the United States, and specifically uh, the Civil War, uh, the, the cases in Indiana, uh, the hysteria that was involved. Hysteria explains a lot of what happens in war. And it isn't that they become hysterical. It is, to be honest about it, we become hysterical because our, our security is involved. And in the Civil War, uh, there were uh, mil uh, military tribunals and people who were uh, sympathetic to the South with charges drawn up against them, not taken from the existing criminal law that existed when they did whatever they did, but rather crimes that were made up for the purpose of the tribunal. That's one of the key issues to keep your eye on is, is what are people charged with? Um, and, and they were uh, uh, brought uh, in, in very vague evidence against them as to some of them. It varied, but then they were executed. Now, uh, In Ray Milligan was the resulting case in the U.S. Supreme Court. Some of them had already been executed, but In Ray Milligan in the U.S. Supreme Court is a wonderful decision. Uh, it didn't help those who had already been executed, uh, so the law is sometimes tardy, let's put it that way. But, uh, but uh, you read it and it's quite clear that the U.S. Supreme Court in, in, at that time, 140 years ago, said, and I quote, the U.S. Constitution is, covers us as a people in time of peace and it covers us in time of war. And uh, that's in Ray Milligan. Now then you jump forward, you get to the Palmer raids in the First World War, Attorney General Palmer um, and he was arresting uh, people he thought were communists, anybody with a beard, uh, any Europeans, you know, uh, Sacco and Vincenti, I mean, you know, people that are different from us, uh, people who are suspect. And when you see that, what you're really seeing is the unhooking of something that is really American. An American believes in individual innocence or individual guilt. That's it. He did it. He didn't. Not that group is guilty, so that group is going to suffer. And when war comes and we become uh, fixated on our own survival, then, then those lines come down. You move to the Second World War, and I've said this uh, in many places, in many venues. You come to the Second World War, uh, the, uh, first of all, the, some Nazi saboteurs landed on Long Island, eight of them with some dynamite. They buried their German uniforms in the sand, and uh, they proceeded almost immediately to surrender themselves to J. Edgar Hoover, big mistake, <laughs> and, uh, who announced to the waiting public that he had apprehended them. I think he apprehended them in, in his office when they walked in. And so all that's going on at the same time. Well, uh, these are bad guys. I mean, they were trained in Germany to blow up American installations. And they got a military tribunal. And they, oh, six of them got executed. Two of them got uh, life imprisonment, uh, later pardoned it when the war was over. But they got lawyers right away. And in Ray Quirin, which is the US Supreme Court case on it, Justice Stone, uh, there's a wonderful book. I'm going to recommend it to you. It's, it's not just about the subject of military tribunals, but it's a minute-by-minute -minute story. The Nazi Saboteurs on Trial by Lewis Fisher. This is a really good, I bet you have this in your library. I bet See, we there do. you go. But I think, frankly, for everything I've heard tonight, you should be afraid to take this out because <laughs> Ashcroft is going to know that you have this book. But if you're a courageous kind of American person, who thinks you're still free, read that book and, and you'll find it. The other one with which a number of people sitting here tonight are familiar, 
was, and I've put it just this way, I put it, I've had opportunities uh, to say this to a lot of people and to remind them that in 1942, small black bands came in on the order of General DeWitt to the Japanese American community on the West Coast and in San Francisco and in the Fillmore. And they put in every resident, kids, grandparents, everybody. And they took some of them over Route 20, uh, 120, north of Yosemite, they took them to Manzanar. And I've been to Manzanar, there's not much there, it's a beautiful spot, by the way. And there are books on it with pictures. That all happened. It not only happened, but I'm told by friends of mine who know that uh, a lot of people that went through that never really got over it. Some did, some didn't. Uh, the people who did that, I'm happy to say, are remembered in American history as rogues. General DeWitt, anybody who knows about him, is, is known for what he did. Uh, the war was over. There was an end to it. When this war will end, which is another subject we can get into. The nature of this war is a different subject we should get into a little bit. I don't know. This is not a war with a foreign army or armies in uniform from a, one country. This is much different than that. So when this will be over, I, I don't know. But uh, that, that removal, um, I will tell you, and I had the chance, uh, we were talking a little bit about this earlier, I think it was around 1986 or something, there was a large dinner, a wonderful dinner, about 600 people in the Japanese American community in the city, and I was asked to come give a speech, and so I had to run around and educate myself so I could look like I knew what I was talking about, and I did, and, and um, but a lot of the folks in that, uh, at that dinner had never really in public before addressed the question that they were wrong. That was wrong. And I must tell you that until 9-11, I said to myself, how could this happen? And I just generally criticized the, the generation before mine. I mean, how could they do it? But I'll tell you something else. When I was representing John Lind, I understood completely how it could happen. Because all it takes is that that is done and everybody else is quiet. And that's the Patriot Act. Uh, when, when General Ashcroft went to the Senate and said anybody who raises civil liberties concerns about this bill is helping terrorists, not one senator said anything to him. It was quiet. And I've made that connection uh, and I think it's a valid one. I now understand, sadly, what it was like in the Fillmore in 1942. They had to get into the vans, they had to sell their houses, and nobody said anything. And that's what happens in war. Susan, you mentioned uh, a few moments ago the whole idea of being spotlighted in terms of mm -hmm. librarians being spotlighted, your profession being spotlighted. Much of this stuff is happening around all of us and a lot of us in our lives we are saying, well, it's not happening. It really doesn't affect me. It doesn't come down to what I'm doing. But you, as you say, are being spotlighted. What, what, what does that do to you, to your, your, to your whole idea of yourself and your profession and your colleagues? Well, I think that um, the Patriot Act, although it's an extremely challenging piece of legislation, has really moved librarians into the forefront of defenders of civil liberties. So often individuals look at librarians as, as you said, uh, folks that want everybody to be quiet, quiet folks themselves, unassuming, behind a desk, reading books. Now I have to tell you that we're very, very busy here and we don't, uh, that's not at all uh, like what it is to work in a library. In fact, when people say, what, what, what should I, what do I need to be like if I want to work in a library? And I say, well, if you like retail, 
you can work in the library because that's what it's all about, helping individuals. But I think we're really carrying the flag for civil, liber civil liberties and protection of confidentiality, and that's, as I said, a hallmark of our profession. But I'd like to just mention a little bit about some other issues that have been going on with the library to put this in context. Um, Mr. Brosnahan had mentioned to me that he had read recently the Supreme Court decision about filtering for internet computers. And as many of you may know, uh, the Supreme Court has decided that filtering compu computers is constitutional. And if public libraries want to rece receive a certain type of federal subsidy on communications costs, they must install filters on their public internet PCs. Now, when this legislation was initially passed and it was uh, fought by the American Library Association for over a two-year period, our Board of Supervisors here was so concerned about it that they passed legislation prohibiting us from installing internet filters on adult or teen PCs. So I have yet to find a jurisdiction that has passed similar legislation, but uh, as we all know, San Francisco is on the forefront of these issues. But um, I went in, I talked about this because librarians for the last several years have been conveyed publicly by some members of the media as porn purveyors because we are out defending the rights of individuals to access information on the internet without filters. Uh, we've, we've gotten a lot of difficult publicity. Uh, the Dr. Laura show, I don't know if many of you listened to Dr. Laura, but she had a tirade for a long time about librarians and how we wanted kids to see porn and that's all we were all about and that's not what we're about. We're about providing access to information. But in fact, um, I somewhat, I don't, I don't look uh, upon welcome with the, with the USA Patriot Act, but I like the situation where we are seen as leaders because for the last several years, frankly, we've had some bad publicity <laughs> in terms of librarians, you know, being concerned with this open access to what's on the internet. So I think it's really a boon for us because it gives us a good opportunity to re-educate or educate everybody in our communities about how important libraries are. Because we do many more things than just protecting the information of your records, but it gives us, us a chance to make sure you all know we're here and all the many things that we do. One of the things that uh, I've done myself in the last few years, is besides being a lawyer and a law professor and a dean, is I've sort of moved into the realm of journalism in the course of the last 10 years or so by doing a lot of legal commentary on television, radio. And uh, one uh, experience that I had directly in regard to this is Jim mentioned Jose Padilla, who is now, who's an American citizen, who's being, who was arrested in Chicago as he came into the United States. And he's been held incommunicado, away from his lawyer, can't talk to anybody, uh, under the provisions of fighting terrorism for secret military type tribunals and proceedings that no one knows anything about. And at the time of the discussions relating to the Patriot Act and all of these secret proceedings that were going to take place for terrorists who were apprehended doing things to the United States, one of the threads that was running through the discussions in Congress uh, and was being said quite openly by the Justice Department, by the Attorney General, I remember it well because of the experience I'm going to highlight for you, was that no American citizen would ever find himself or herself in that situation of being the victim of secret proceedings. Those were the things that were said quite explicitly when these discussions were taking place right after 9-11, when Congress was involved in these things. And I looked at this, the things that were being recommended, and I saw no exemption for American citizens in this. And in one of the commentaries that I did at one of the local net networks, I said, Americans will be tied up in this. And the, the, man, the, the program manager, the station manager, called me the next day and said, you know, we had a lot of calls about your saying that last night from a lot of people. And they had the attorney general and people in Congress were all saying that this isn't going to happen to Americans. So you were wrong about that. I said, no, I'm not wrong about that. Uh, and we had quite an argument uh, over that. And as a result of that, he didn't call me and use me again on that station. And it was about a year later when they had a new station manager 
that called me and said, you know, we haven't, haven't been using you lately. We'd really like your commentary. Would you come back? I said, sure. But that gives you a little bit of an overview of something else that's been bothering me, the whole way the media and the lack of any critical coverage, except for particular places like NPR and a couple of small areas. For the most part, we live in the age of Fox News, and if one criticizes this, a journalist, a so-called journalist in an outlet like Fox News will label you as someone who's unpatriotic or someone who is an appeaser of terrorists. But the whole aspect of that that's my little editorial aspect of it, but I want to segue that into the whole aspect of secret trials, secret proceedings. Jim, America and secret trials and secret proceedings, am I missing something? But there was a time not long ago when that was something that was totally antithetical to, to what we are as a people. It is antithetical, and it's, it's not only the legal principles uh, that, that you're mentioning, uh, uh, what the Constitution says and all that, the rights of the defendant. The truth is, Americans love trials. I speak as a trial lawyer. We love trials. Kobe Bryant was in the room with the lady. What happened with the panties and all this kind of stuff? Don't say you haven't been following it. Don't tell me that. <laughs> don't, don't give me that stuff. You, you, you understand what came out last week. And, he, and he's got a defense lawyer. I think the defense is doing a great job. But we, we know, we think we know about that. Now that's a matter, I'm not saying it's not a serious matter, but it's not as serious as our national security and our personal safety. We need to know, uh, and a trial would show this, what Padilla really did. did he, was he planning to have a dirty bomb in Washington, D.C. to obliterate our government? Was he doing that? If you had a public trial, among other things, the public would understand what it is that's going on. And here's the key. We would be better able to determine whether Ashcroft is doing a good job. I, I tell you, I don't think he is. Not on the civil rights side alone. I do not think General Ashcroft is a very good enforcer of the laws. I don't think he's a very good detective. I mean, detectives on TV solve it within one hour. That's a high standard. But, but how do we know when he puts these people away where he does? So yes, public trials. The irony is that in wartime, you need more critique because it's more important. Lives are at stake. And we have a stake in this. Uh, this you, you drive over the Bay Bridge, you're daydreaming, and you think, well, uh, this morning, I mean, how, how hard would it be for somebody to blow it? You know, can they, get, can they get there? Can we really stop them? You need to know this. It is true that the American press did not provide us with very much, especially for the first six, eight, ten months. Uh, the English press, uh, and just because the Lynn case I had access to it, uh, the BBC and so forth, they, they would criticize us. Uh, the, the European press would talk about the, the 400 people who died at Kuala Jungi in Afghanistan, uh, which is kind of neither here nor there, but you know, that's a lot of people. And under what circumstances did they die? I mean, are, are, they, uh, are there issues there of, uh, that involve us? The, you know there is a there is a right to know, and so, uh, and that's I, I think that's what library is all about too. Really, is you've got all these books in here, you probably have a copy in this library of Hugo Grotius. Do you? Well, I can check. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> See, that's you're you're a retail person. See that? That's the way that works. Well, Hugo Grotius uh, lived, I think, in the late 1500s. Uh, he lived in uh, a city, the same city that the painter Vermeer lived in. Vermeer used to do these great paintings of interiors, and you, you look at the painting, and it's like you're in the room. He did only, they say, 25 paintings in the whole life because he took all the time. But Grotius was so smart, he was a lawyer, that the king of France said he was, the, he was a gift from God to Europe. I mean, he must have been a very smart guy. And he wrote a book on what? He wrote a book on the rights and responsibilities with regard to war. And he used the Bible as his source. That's my favorite point. He used the Bible as his source for natural law 
to cover when is a, a war justified? When, when are you justified in starting a war? There are circumstances, he thinks, when you can. How should you treat prisoners of war? Because the Bible says you will not vex your prisoners. I like to say for emphasis, that's the word of God, that you will not vex your prisoners. And in all this is some kind of swirling, crazy, fundamentalist, Christian something or other that is public. There was a general last week who made it public that we are somehow uh, doing all this in God's mandate. And uh, I, I, would, I would question, I think, I accuse Ashcroft of this. I don't think that he has read Hugo Grosius. I don't think he has read this. And we should send him a copy of this book. We'll, <laughs> we'll borrow it from this library. We'll, tell him, we'll send it to him, and I'll, I'm not afraid. I'll tell him, I took this book out of this library. I'll send it to him, and I'll tell him it's due in two weeks. And if he doesn't, doesn't get it back, it'll cost him. What will it cost him? Uh, up to five dollars, and then he has to pay for the price of the book. <laughs> All right. So uh, no, no. I should say we should give it to him for free, no charge. That's retail, huh? <laughs> for Mr. Ashcroft, our friend. Well, we'll find out, Susan. So, so, so much of what's happening now in terms of the federal government and uh, the attorney general and the way the whole uh, institution of government is dealing with this and so many other things is, is to not give information, to keep things secret, to say information is bad, uh, information is dangerous. Uh, librarians are in the business of giving information. They see things from another viewpoint, don't they? Oh, we certainly do. That's, that's really what we're all about, is providing information in a variety of formats. And, you know, I was just thinking historically a little bit about this issue of the confidentiality of, of information. And when you think back historically, even in our own lifetime, I think libraries have played a very low-key local role, an effective role, but low-key for many years. Now just think when you used to go to the library in your hometown or when you were a child and the system you had for checking out books was a card where you signed your name, you handed it to the librarian, she stamped the book, you brought it back. You could look at that card and see every person that had checked out that book. And you would think, oh, Mar Mrs. Smith took this out. It must be a good one. We like the same mystery. So to, to a certain extent, uh, on a very localized level, knowing who's read different books helped inform people make their, make their choices about their reading. But over the last part of this century, libraries have become more and more complex. All of our systems, for the most part, are computerized, and we're retaining lots and lots of information about individuals. Now, one of the things that we did here at the San Francisco Public Library when the Patriot Act, when the USA Patriot Act was passed, and this was something that was strongly recommended by the American Library Association, was we did something called a privacy audit. And we took a look at all the records that we were keeping about individuals and also transactions that they had here at the library. And we realized, as is won't, uh, a won't for librarians to do, we were really keeping more than we needed to keep. You know, we are, we do keep. We're keepers, we love to have lots of information, but we looked very carefully at what we were keeping and we decided that for business purposes, we have to keep some amount of information, but we reduced the amount of information we were keeping just to what we really needed to do for business purposes. So for instance, if the system, our online system crashed, we could reconstruct it. So from that point of view, we were being proactive in, in looking at our situation and saying, well, if we're, you know, we're asked to provide some information for an individual, if we don't have that information, we just can't provide it. So we weren't trying to be uh, not helpful, we were trying to be as businesslike as possible. There's an interesting story, some of you may have been aware that earlier this year, the Santa Cruz um, library director 
was very proactive about the situation and decided to post signs on all her public PCs in her library saying, beware, you know, this information may be subpoenaed by the government. And, and we could talk a little bit later about signs. We, we, didn't, we didn't go the sign route. But, you know, there's also the, um, the uh, part of the Patriot Act that requires an individual who might be required to provide information. So if I had to give information on Virginia G, for example, which I know would never happen, I could not, after I gave the information to the FBI, I could not tell Virginia, Virginia, gee, the FBI just came in and I had to give them your borrowing record. So what uh, the Santa Cruz Library Director did, and I think it's pretty uh, savvy, really, every month on her library board agenda, she had an item where she said, we have received no request under the Patriot Act this month. So if there was a month when she didn't say that, then that would be the key, <laughs> that she got one. So she had figured out this way to communicate to the public what was going on. So, I mean, we are all about information, and we're here to provide information to enrich people's lives and, and to have uh, an environment that's very, very comfortable, something that was very chilling to all of us here at the library early this year, earlier this year when there was lots of discussion hitting the press about the USA Patriot Act, we had um, a, a work with a teen group who was advising the library on how we could better provide services to teens. That's what we're always, we always want to do that and they're a particularly challenging group to work with. And one of the teens was a GLBT uh, young woman and she said at this meeting, you know, I've heard about this Patriot Act and I'm not checking out any books anymore. I come here because I want to learn about my lifestyle and I don't want anybody to know. So that was very chilling to, to us here in the library. And of course, we tried to assure her that that wouldn't happen. But, you know, the word's getting out there and it's affecting how people think about and use their library. But we're just here to say that if you use the San Francisco Public Library, you can be assured of your privacy. But it's a challenge for us when we're all about providing information and now we have to think about regrouping and making sure that what we're doing is effective yet still protecting our users' rights. One of the things I was listening to on the way over here today is that there was a congressional hearing today before the Senate Judiciary Committee. And the, sen the senators are now starting to express the concern that, as Jim said, they shied away from when Ashcroft first came to them and accused them all of being traitors, if they, any of them being traitors who contradicted what he was asking for with the Patriot Act. And they were, Senator Biden was saying, you know, well, there's an empty chair there and we've been waiting for Senator, for Attorney General Ashcraft to come and he never comes and we'd like to hear from him. He goes all around the country and he talks to compatible groups. He doesn't come to debates like this and talk, but let's give the devil his due, Jim. And um, if Ashcroft were here, what he'd probably say is he'd look at the three of us and say, well, Mr. Brosnan, Ms. Hildreth, Mr. Keene, you're, you're all very comfortable sitting here in the safety of a San Francisco library, and but there are terrorists out there, and it's a dangerous world, and look what happened at 9-11, and all of these things are for the protection of all of you. What would your answer be to him? My answer was uh, twofold. First, um, although this history will be written later and is not too important, the people in Washington, by my observation, knew everything they had to know about Osama bin Laden, who had issued a fatwa, which is a, uh, and he's not authorized to do it. Most Muslim scholars think uh, he, he's not. Certain people can issue fatwas, but he could not, but he did. And it, it's like a declaration of war on the United States uh, that President Clinton had uh, bombed in Afghanistan in 1997, uh, one of the camps where they were training terrorists that their intelligence sources surely must have known that there were a great many Saudis who were not only coming to Afghanistan, but were helping to finance Osama bin Laden. If they didn't know that, they were incompetent. So, but that's ancient history. Now let's go to how to defend us at this point. First of all, um, the uh, question arises, how long, uh, Two, two big questions. The first one is, General Ashcroft, how long is this war going to last? Uh, is this uh, the Second World War, uh, four and a half years? Uh, is this the troubles in Northern Ireland? Peter knows uh, a lot about that, and I know a little bit about that. The troubles in Northern Ireland from 1972, uh, they're still going on a little bit uh, to this day. 
are you changing America for the next 30 or 40 years? And by the way, are you, if I could just get him somewhere to debate, what are your qualifications to tell us to be quiet? Who are you? And what do you know? And, and this, this world that you want to take us to, this new country that you want to create, which this country has never been, is fundamentally different from the one created by the founders of this country. And don't tell me they didn't have problems. They had the revolution. Jefferson had to flee his own home because the British troops were coming. They thought the French were going to invade. That, that's what the Sedition Act that Peter mentioned was all about. The French were going to invade. They had all kinds of problems. But when they wrote the Constitution, they said the Fourth Amendment. They said the Fifth Amendment. They said the Sixth Amendment. And you're sitting here in this auditorium, I wish, and telling us that you're going to do away with that, and you're not telling us how long. And do you, suppose we even wanted to do it for a year. Are you a person of sufficient discretion so that we should trust your stability? I don't think so. And that's where Congress, I can't believe, I mean, I, I try to understand politics, but I don't think I do. <laughs> even if you thought, well, we gotta do this for a while and let's be reasonable, the last person you would give these powers to is General Ashcroft. He is the last person you would get. Do you know what he's done, among other things? He has provided a rider in a bill that if any federal judge, different part of the government, goes under the sentencing guidelines, there are these guidelines, and there are procedures for going under them. There's still some discretion a judge can do it. If any federal judge does it, their name gets reported to Congress. That's what he thinks you should do. You should just report everybody that has any opinion other than what he believes in. Now, you couldn't run a computer company in Silicon Valley that way by telling all the bright engineers, we don't care what you think, it's only what I think. You have to have freedom of speech. You have to let people say what they want to say. And he's against that. He's as strongly against that as anybody that I've seen. So we, we, I'll stop for a second. We ought to come back and talk a little bit more about what this war is really like, because this is a different kind of a war. Why don't you go ahead, Jim? And then we'll well, I, I, I'm just going to make this point, I, um, and, and we've referred to part of it. There are fundamental uh, fundamentalist Muslims. I don't know what the number is. But I don't think it's very large. It may be growing, but I don't think it's very large. Uh, if we start in Afghanistan, uh, there was Osama bin Laden, and there were members of Al-Qaeda who were trained to be terrorists. These are bad guys, bad people. No question about it. They mean us harm. They don't like us, and mostly they don't like Israel. And we support Israel and so they really don't like us. So uh, now, and they're not in one place. They're in the Philippines, they're in Indonesia, uh, they're in uh, Chechnya, uh, they're in Kashmir, uh, they're in Pakistan, uh, they're, they're, in a, they're maybe in Yemen. Uh, they're, they're all over the world. All right, now, we, we are facing those dangers. And to be serious about it, we've got to be serious people that figure out how to deal with that. I mentioned Northern Ireland to you. This is not, people didn't follow this very closely. Peter did, but others didn't. President Clinton was able to achieve a ceasefire in Northern Ireland when there was no political support for it at all in the United States. People didn't care and all that. They had. 400 years of religious differences, which is part of what's going on here. He did it with money, he did it with diplomacy, he did it with charm. If somebody tells you that we cannot get a ceasefire in Israel, I suggest to you, you tell them that President Clinton did exactly that in Northern Ireland. It can be done by leaders who are smart enough 
diplomatic enough and far-sighted enough to do it. If we could get a ceasefire in Israel, a ceasefire, I'm not talking about resolving all of the problems, I'm talking about a ceasefire in Israel, you would de-escalate the heat in, in the Arab world against not only Israel, but against the United States. That would be, to me, the most effective thing you could possibly do, number two. We gave Saudi Arabia a pass on what they have done to us in New York and in the Pentagon building. And no one denies it. I was on a panel up in Boise, Idaho, and former Senator Slade Gordon was there and on the panel. And he's on the commission that's studying 9-11 but I asked him this question. I said, can you explain to me why the U.S. government has given the Saudi Saudis a pass on what they did in Afghanistan and what they're doing by way of financing some of the people in Saudi Arabia, financing terrorism? Can you explain or justify that? He's, he's a Republican, and he's uh, certainly close to the administration. He said, no, he couldn't justify it. Now. Should you worry about that? Are you entitled to think about that? You mean to say that every time I get on Southwest to go to Los Angeles, I have to take my shoes off? But in Saudi Arabia, they, are still, they still have people who are uh, attuned to the idea that they're gonna kill Americans, and they're, they've got money to do it. There were Saudis in Afghanistan in pretty good numbers, and that's not a secret. Of, of the hijackers, a large percentage, were Saudis. What's that all about? You're entitled to think about it, worry about it. So the, the, the real point on the war, the nature of this war, is diplomatically, how do we reduce the world tension and pressures? If we don't end this war, uh, the, the head of the UN said the other day, I couldn't, Kofi fan, and I couldn't agree with him more. He just said it so simply. He said, as long as there are Western troops on Arab land, there will be people trying to kill them. I think we all know that. I don't think that's a secret. Inside the Beltway, they do not know that. So send them a letter. <laughs> call, call them up. Email is a wonderful thing. <laughs> Make sure they understand this, because as long, as, and, and finally, Peter, at, I'm afraid at great length, oh, no. there were very few Iraqis in Afghanistan. And those that were there were alienated from the Iraqi government. They almost uh, had fled the Iraqi government. The Iraqi government was a non-sectarian government. It was not a religious thing. It wasn't Osama bin Laden. It wasn't anything. This is over and above you know, the weapons of mass destruction and all this stuff. In addition to that, they, they were not at the center of this terrorism thing that is plaguing our people, but Saudi Arabia was. So I think we need to reflect on that and just think about it a little bit. I just, could I add one comment, uh, Peter? I really uh, listened and picked up on what Mr. Brosnahan said about the Beltway being out of touch and I think they really are. I, I think what we're seeing happening is the heightened awareness of the USA Patriot Act and library confidentiality is a grassroots way for people to, to weigh in about their concerns about the USA Patriot Act. I mean, it's very hard for those of us that aren't in tune with government or, or the legal system on a daily basis to figure out how to, how to latch on to this issue. But when we think about people finding out what we're checking out from the library, that really hits at home. And I think the folks in Washington do not understand how much that means to citizens. They're not listening to that. They're not in tune with that. Just like Mr. Ashcroft goes on the Today Show and maligns librarians who, for the most part, are a revered profession and a, a part, folks in the society are respected. I think that was a mistake on his part. 
I think people tend to minimize what librarians can do. Another example is that Michael Moore, who's a very radical author, you know, had a book ready to go on the Bush administration after 9-11 and his publisher was not going to publish it and they wanted him to tone it down and he wasn't about to do that. So he got the word out to some of his friends, librarians, who do a lot of business with publishers and the librarians began an email campaign to his publishing house and they ended up publishing that book, thanks to librarians advocating for it. So I think that we, librarians, represent grassroots America, some of the benefits of our American life. The public library is one of the last open civil institutions we have in our society, and I think people value that, and I think they're showing that through their response to the USA Patriot Act, and I certainly think Mr. Ashcroft and maybe some of his other colleagues back there certainly have no idea of the level of, of feeling that I think the whole thing is generating. In the time remaining, I'd like to open it up to some questions from you all. I, I saw, yes. Why don't you start again so we'll have your question. I heard on the radio uh, some time back, either KPFA or some other alternative radio station, the former president of the American Library Association pointed out that even though Ashcroft has said we haven't used the Patriot Act against librarians that I know of, this particular person said, he said it's not true. There were instances, now he did not give the instances my first question, are you aware of what he had said? Yes, I'm aware. Number one. And number two, uh, I know this is rather lengthy dialogue that I could pursue further, but you know, the question comes in as to what terror really is. Now, terror historically can represent perhaps the killing of innocent people through armed conflict. Uh, when Ashcroft would be asked when will terror ever end? He can simply answer, until we catch the last terrorist. Of course, that will be never. Now, Noam Chomsky pointed out that the only way you could end terror is stop being a terrorist yourself. Now, I know people are going to argue about this point. Chomsky has said that number one nation in the world that's a terrorist nation is the U.S. People can argue that point here or, or, or not. What I want to do, make a point is that when the Cold War ended, it really didn't end. It continued in another uh, huge drift. Back in 1951. Let, let, let's get the answer to your specific question first from Susan. You had a specific question yes. about how do you know whether or not the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, there, there is some sort of scrutiny of uh, the librarians' uh, materials as to who's taking out what? A survey was uh, issued early this, earlier this year before Mr. Ashcroft made his comment uh, that documented about 50 requests that had been um, uh, engendered around the country as a result of the USA Patriot Act to, to libraries, all types of libraries. And you have to understand many also go to academic libraries where there's a higher, in some cases, a higher likelihood at least of very high, high de highly detailed research. And then of course, Mr. Ashcroft said none had been issued, which is just contradictory to all the evidence that we have. I don't want to cut you off, sir, but we have a lot of questions, a little time remaining. So can we go to uh, some, yes, ma'am. The down here, Glenn. Um, <clears throat> I've heard rumors that there's some attempts to modify the USA Patriot Act, and I've heard a term called Benjamin Franklin True Patriot Act. Is that an attempt to modify? I forget there was the candidate. There is a there is Patriot Act too. Which right. There's also some other modification or well, another bill being introduced. There's two things happening. Uh, a number of legislators have put forward legislation to modify the Patriot Act, particularly to amend out the uh, information regarding bookstores and libraries. And um, late, uh, late May, we had Representative Bernie Sanders, independent from Vermont, who was 
really leading the charge there was right here in the Corette Auditorium. We had a great public town hall meeting with him and a number of other legislators, including both our own senators, have signed on to that. At the same time, there is a Patriot Act too, which furthers uh, the current initiatives of this Patriot Act, which is very frightening. But I do think that the tide in Washington and our elected officials is turning. I think they're hearing from their voters that they're not comfortable with the USA Patriot Act. And in fact, Mr. Sanders made it very clear that this was an issue that was garnering the support of people on the far left and people on the far right, because for each for their own purposes, they really don't like uh, the government intrusion into their affairs. So hopefully we'll get some amendments uh, out of Congress on this legislation. Gentlemen over there. Uh, briefly, to follow up on your idea about diplomacy, possibly ending the war, and your example you gave about Ireland, and to follow up on this gentleman's question, how long will this terrorism go on, the war on terrorism go on? I was monitoring the BBC on the 12th of September. At that time, a reporter from the Middle East had interviewed close contacts to Osama bin Laden. He had three demands for all terrorism against the United States to stop. Demand one was to stop the one-sided support of Israel. Demand two, end the sanctions against Iraqi, Iraq. And demand three, all U.S. businesses out of the Middle East. Three simple demands, possibly. Had you heard about this? I only heard this once on the BBC. I never heard it again. Yeah. Now, what do you think about this? Uh, well, I, I don't trust Osama bin Laden. Uh, so, so he has those demands. But I think, uh, and, and, I, and he is not uh, a spokesperson for the Arab world, and I think most Arab leaders would agree with that idea. The idea of U.S. troops on Arab soil is a sensitivity that we have missed. Um, and if our national security requires it, as it did in the Cold War, I'm assuming that. Uh, that's one situation. Um, it, the visibility of, uh, of uh, American troops uh, on Arab soil uh, it is a provocative act, not only to the Osama bin Ladens of the world, but to others as well. That's just a fact. Uh, I, I don't suggest any policy as a result of it. Um, uh, as to... Uh, uh, the support of Israel, um, I think diplomacy is the order of the day um, to bring Mr. Sharon uh, to Camp David, uh, Arafat, if that's the right person, and lock the door, and they don't get out. <laughs> we, we are much more powerful than, uh, than we think in that regard, and they don't get out until they've agreed to something and uh, then, we make it, then we make it happen. So I, I, I really do believe, now, um, when you try to talk to people who know a lot more about this than I do, they say it's difficult, uh, they're working on it, uh, you know, they'd like to do it, uh, and all that. But um, I, I, I again say that Clinton, uh, who in many ways is a very bright, strong kind of person, uh, you, you may remember, I don't know if you remember this, but when he was going out of office, when Bush was coming in, he, he was still trying to settle the Israeli problem, at least get a ceasefire, right up to the 20th of, uh, he knew, he knew what was involved. The reason he, he knew what was involved, I mean, his people were fully aware, I think, of the dangers from Osama bin Laden. There was a meeting, I actually talked to the former ambassador to Afghanistan. I called him up, he taught at Stanford, and he answered the phone. And I asked him whether it was true that there was a meeting in Berlin of diplomats in late July of 2001 for the purpose of discussing the dangers of Afghanistan. Six plus two, they call it. The six countries that border Afghanistan plus Russia and the United States. And there was indeed such a meeting, he said, and they discussed uh, the problems. There was a dispute about how strong the language was, but basically it was a message to the Afghanis, uh, you either let us give you money and economics, mostly uh, there's a pipeline there that they've wanted through Afghanistan for years, or we will bury you in bombs, or we will, this is America talking to Afghanistan in July 
There's no question that meeting happened. That is, I didn't read it in some left-wing, right-wing book or something. I didn't make it up. This is coming from the ambassador. So uh, the, the, the diplomatic recognition, uh, the dependency on oil uh, has been reduced since 1973, our panelists may remember the long lines of cars in 1973. The, our our uh, dependence on, on that oil has re been reduced, I, I read the other day, from 45 to 35 percent. Our dependency on oil is a big part of this. That's, our, that's our problem in Saudi Arabia, part of it. Well, we have to think about these things. Yes, ma'am. Questioners identify themselves before they speak give their name if if you care to i mean you don't you don't it, it's it's up to the individual a gentleman in the back has been very patient uh, <laughs> you got mr right i like that. one way over there one my question is for ms hildreth and it has to do with uh resistance to the uh depredations of the patriot act on librarians and library patrons uh, what would be uh, effective uh, as a method of resistance? Uh, I would like a general answer, if you have one, for that. But I would also like your specific comment on my own suggestion. What if librarians in the United States generally, through the ALA, the SLA, whatever, all their organizations, agreed uh, or let's say 75% of them agreed, I don't think that's uh, outrageous, uh, that they were not going to comply. Now, that's criminal, but if they quit without notice, as soon as they got uh, instruction from the authorities to turn in the names of any of their patrons, that's nothing that the authorities can do anything about. And what if another library in, in that city hired them? They're, they're, they're scot-free. There's nothing the authorities can do about it. And what if the library that hired them then had a surplus of one librarian who went to the first library? Let, let's get the answer from the woman who's going to go to jail on that one. <laughs> Susan? Uh, would you like yeah. my card? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll have to. I, I think Mr. Brosnan <laughs> yeah. could really, uh, I could use his services. Well, I, I think that's a very valid question. You know, how far are you going to defend any of these issues? I know that when we had our town hall meeting here in May, uh, a librarian was with us from Berkeley. Her name is Zoya Horn, a very a famous librarian who was working in an academic library during the Vietnam War and had materials subpoenaed, and she absolutely refused, and she did go to jail. Um, I have to be honest with you. I'm not sure that I could get all my colleagues to, to be that dedicated to this cause. Um, of course, I would recommend members of the public doing every they could, everything they can to advocate with their local legislators, state and federal legislators, and voice their concerns. Now, here in the city of San Francisco, uh, the Board of Supervisors is considering legislation that would remove the authority or opportunity, if you will, for any department head to respond to any of these Federal, federal Information Act requests and all the requests would have to be funneled to the Board of Supervisors. So in a sense, if, uh, and I think, you know, it's an interesting tact. I think the legislation is, was introduced by Supervisor McGoldrick, who's very strongly concerned about the Patriot Act. And in that way, it would remove someone like myself, a department head or one of our, li our librarians from having to make that decision and move it into the higher realm. Now, I don't know if other jurisdictions are looking at that, but I do know in San Francisco that's a tack they're taking. And I would, you know, I'd just like to say that I really appreciate your suggestion about us just saying no. Um, I don't know that we're, we're there yet, but we could get there. Yes. I want to follow up on that. You mentioned the uh, survey uh, where you got 50 responses, or the AL did, ALA did, or some group of librarians, mm -hmm. um, queried librarians across the nation. 50 mm -hmm. responded, or at least one library with 50 responses 
Uh, no, it was a number of libraries, up to 50, yeah. Did the survey ask if someone refused to answer, or did they just ask? For no, I think they just they asked if you had been if you had been uh, faced with a patriot a request from the USA Patriot Act. Follow up on the survey. Um, I don't know if these people were identified, but mm -hmm. if, even if it was blind identification, what happened? Right. Uh, that if they refused the, um, that something would happen. Right, we can suggest that. I don't understand what book it is that the library has that is going to help the terrorist. What is what no, book? It's the How internet. to make a bomb or something? Uh, well, first of all, we you know we have many books and materials about bomb making, and over the years they've always been challenged. But I believe that the government is worried about the internet. You know, there's still a lot of information in books, but we have, we provide access to the internet, you know, all, every, every website you could possibly get at, mm -hmm. and that's what their interest seems to be focused on. Now, luckily here at the San Francisco Public Library, um, last summer, or, yeah, last summer before, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going on here, we installed an online sign-up system to our computers. We didn't do this because of the Patriot Act. We were planning to do it anyway, but, the result of that is that when you sign up for public use of a PC here, you have a limited period of time, a half an hour is your time slot. When your time slot is finished, then our online system automatically erases all the sites that you visited. So we cannot provide to the government that information even if they asked us. And we also instituted this online sign-up system, which is also a private system, and every day we dump the information of who signed up for what computer. Now, many libraries don't have that level of sophistication on their PCs, and they do hand sign-ups. And you see these video images, media images of shredding of sign-up lists. If you see that, it's a very hot, hot topic with the uh, media when you talk about the role of the media. When the media comes to us, all they want to know is, can we get a picture of you shredding sign-up lists? <laughs> I'm not kidding. And we say, you know, we have an online system, and, and we don't have that, and we automatically get rid of all your names. We have really good protection. Well, we don't care. We just want a picture of shredding. And then we say, well, you have to go to Santa Cruz if you want to get shredding. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think we've come to the end of our time. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>